Good morning, my name is Father Ryan Humphreys and this is COVID Catechism from the Catholic Underground. We are now reaching kind of the end of this quarantine period in terms of not being able to get to church, not being able to have access to the sacraments. And so uh, we're kind of winding down COVID Catechism and the Catholic Underground is going to be presenting what we're going to call the CU Catechast. Uh, Father Chris will do one, I'll do one every week, and so we'll be able to provide kind of an ongoing uh, structure, but a little bit perhaps a little bit more varied, a little bit more spread out. My topic today is five non-religious proofs for the existence of God. Every 101 uh, philosophy student has kind of made their way through these. Uh, usually, if you could do that at a secular university, you don't get a very fair hearing. Uh, but these are remarkable proofs. They're, they're really kind of three different categories of proofs. The first three work as a team. Then number four builds upon that. And then number five kind of completes the picture. Uh, these proofs all come from St. Thomas Aquinas. And in fact, most of them flow in a very real way from Plato and from from Aristotle. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century Italian nobleman. Uh, he joined up with the Dominicans against his family's wishes uh, and went to Paris to study philosophy and theology. He was the greatest thinker probably in the history of the world. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, it should not be said lightly. He was an incredibly remarkable thinker. Uh, his most famous writing is a huge book, a tome called the Summa Theologica. The Summa is the first great encyclopedia of theology and Christian philosophy. Uh, back in a time when books were still being copied by monks, uh, when it was relatively difficult to get access to a lot of, uh, certainly of larger books, he compiled this incredible encyclopedia. Now he starts with the existence of us. And then he proves God's existence philosophically from pure reason. And then he does mortality and morality. Then he takes us through Plato and Aristotle and he manages to synthesize the two in what is called the great synthesis. Uh, two thinkers who really everybody thought were, were opposing, Plato and Aristotle. One was the teacher of the other, but their works did not jibe the way that Plato thought about things, the way that Aristotle thought about them, especially in the world of the philosophy of existence, which is what we call metaphysics is the name given to it. Uh, these kind of just bounced off each other and it was incompatible the way that Plato thinks and the way that Aristotle thinks, but St. Thomas Aquinas read them more deeply and he fit them together into one cohesive way of thinking, which he presents in the Summa Theologica. And then as he kind of moves past natural philosophy, he grabs St. Augustine, he grabs St. Paul, and he grabs a handful of other saints, and he starts to bring all of that in as well. And you end up with this incredibly remarkable work that is obviously not a simple read. It's not something you know that you just sit down and start working your way through. You need some, some training just to walk through the door, but it's an incredible piece of writing. Now, perhaps the most famous chunk of the Summa, and the chunk we're looking at today, is his proof for the existence of God from what we would call pure reason. So he's not reaching for the Bible. He's not reaching for, for some other uh, you know, kind of thought or someone else's argument. He's not reaching for some kind of, of roundabout proof. He's not looking at a scientific theory that may be true or may not. This is a purely logical expression that based on the basic foundation of what we know about the universe, God must exist. And to be clear, St. Thomas is not setting out at this section to prove that God the Father who spoke to Abraham exists from pure reason. He's not trying to prove Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. He's simply saying a divine being, something outside of this universe that has some of the characteristics of God must exist before we ever look at science or at inspired books. We can know that there must be something with some of the characteristics of God that we know that we could prove if we never had a Bible, if we lived on, on a tiny island and never had access to anybody else, no proof, no science, no nothing, just from the fact that I can see that something is moving or that something exists or that I exist, 
I can draw some logical conclusions. And that's what St. Thomas is trying to do. Now, it's relatively easy to understand most of these. The difficulty we have is that a lot of those Philosophy 101 students I'm talking about had professors who had their, their hair, their head, positively rammed up their posterior and were educated into imbecility, as one of my old professors used to say. These are people who are desperate to assume God does not exist, and therefore they take these philosophy arguments and they start by saying, one, God does not exist. Two, here's the argument. But the argument is wrong because God doesn't exist. And that's just bad thinking. It's called arguing in a circle or assuming the conclusion. And this happens a lot. People will look at religion and they'll say, well, I'm starting off with the idea God doesn't exist. And from there, I'm going to make a bunch of random statements and therefore God doesn't exist. But that's not real logic. That's not an honest point of view that says, I want to know what reality is. We see a lot of that nowadays with bad science, right? We complain when an oil company pays a scientist to find that there is no such thing as global warming because we assume that he is going to start his science by saying, all my money comes from the oil company, therefore I need to assume that global warming is not a big deal in order to continue getting that money. Now that's the same thing with people who get paid by governments to prove global warming does exist, which is its own separate problem. But it's bad philosophy. It's bad logic to start from the idea that I want to conclude this. Now I'm looking for things to prove that conclusion. And St. Thomas doesn't do that. St. Thomas starts off by being very fair and saying, look, here's, here's what we know and here's what we don't. What conclusions can we reach? He's not trying to, to say, I need to prove that we should all love our neighbor as ourselves by pure reason. That's something that comes from the Bible. He's saying, I'm trying to figure out what do we know if all we know is reason, is logic. The five arguments he provides, and as I said, the first three are a group and then the other two kind of build on it. The argument from motion, if you can believe, if something moves, God must exist. It's a fascinating argument. Then the second one is like it. It's called the argument from causation of existence. The third is called the argument from contingent and necessary being. The fourth is called the argument from the degrees of perfection. And then the fifth is called the argument from intelligent design, but it has nothing to do with the intelligent design that you've heard about in other places. Now, before we walk these, through these, we want to realize that no modern scientist around, no modern philosopher around, has actually made a good argument against what St. Thomas is proposing here. You kind of have three categories of people who make arguments. One is people who go, uh, -uh, uh and just kind of reject out of hand because they've assumed God doesn't exist, and so they simply say, therefore, St. Thomas is wrong, and I don't even have to talk about it. The second part of that same group are people who say, well, it's old, man. I mean, this is the 1200s. Ugh. You need better, newer arguments because newer is better. I mean, St. Thomas never even had Starbucks. And so, you know, those are both stupid arguments that are actually book-length arguments from people who are atheists in the world today. It's incredibly tragic. The only kind of interesting argument is that you have people who really try to engage and say, now hang on, this, that, the other, motion, so on and so forth, and they try to bring it together. The problem is St. Thomas is building his logical arguments on such an important foundational principle, one that's called causality that we'll get into. It's so important that as soon as you try to pull that out and you say, well, hang on, what if causality is not a thing? Then you find out that, well, oops, all of science is based on causality because every effect must have a cause. That's it. That's the whole principle. And so if we say, nah, -uh, then we're left saying, well, then all of science is just a sham. And so we have real problems where people who try to make an argument, the difficulty is they almost always end up contradicting themselves, and then they kind of tap dance around the idea that their contradiction is right there for people to see. Again, most of the arguments against this start with the conclusion, then make a bunch of rambling, 
then make a bunch of assumptions, and then end up proving, gee whiz, God didn't exist, but we started with that assumption. And so, you know, it doesn't make for a very compelling response to what St. Thomas has said. So, let's get right into these and really hammer these five arguments for the existence of God, these non-religious arguments from pure reason. Number one, uh, the first argument is the argument for motion, and it works in three basic steps. Number one, stuff is moving. There, see, I'm moving right now. My hands are moving. There's the microphone moving. Things are moving. Number two, stuff doesn't move by itself. Stuff only moves because something else puts it into motion. Now, this is something that, of course, you know, Newton is going to lock in on, and he's going to have some important things to say about inertia and motion and objects at rest tend to remain at rest and so on and so forth. But the idea that something didn't move unless it was moved by something else was not something that Isaac Newton came up with in the 15 and 1600s. This was something that was understood way, way, way back to the early pre-Socratic Greeks. This is folks even before Socrates was writing in the 300s. BC. And so, number one, stuff is moving. Number two, stuff doesn't move unless something moves it. Number three, then, the therefore is if number one is true that stuff is moving, and if two, stuff doesn't move unless it's moved by something else, then there must be something which moves by its own power and not by the power of something else. And that unmoved mover we call God or the divine. Now this is not kind of a, a really basic argument that it sounds like. This is not a goofy argument where somebody is saying, well, you know, so if that ball got moved, then something must have moved the ball. Well, it was a foot, and the foot moved the ball. But what moved the foot? Well, muscles. Well, what moved the muscles? Well, it must be electricity in the body. Well, what moved the electricity in the body? Well, that's atoms moving. Well, what well, atoms are moving, what moves atoms? Well, we look inside atoms, and then we got, uh, you know, neutrons and protons. Well, inside of those, we have quarks, and inside of that, we have a Higgs field, and we go on and on and on until we finally have to say, but something had to put it all into motion. Even if we end up back at the Big Bang, something had to make the stuff of the Big Bang. And so stuff doesn't move unless it is created by something, unless it's moved by something. Those two things we assume, therefore, there's got to be something that's outside of that regression, that's outside of that list that moves by its own power. And I'm not talking about I move my hand by my own power. I'm talking about down to the atomic level that doesn't need anything else, but that moves by its own power. And so this becomes a really sophisticated argument that sounds really simple. Because he's saying the unmoved mover has to exist in a way which is fundamentally different from our universe. Everything in our universe moves, that's easy, it's visible. Now, he stole this from, from Aristotle, who wrote this argument 1,500 years before he did. Then Thomas isn't trying to pretend this is something new. Uh, and, and you'll notice one of the things that Thomas does a lot is to steal other people's ideas and then improve on them, which is not in any way bad. He, he presents the idea and says, look, this is what Aristotle said. I'm going I'm to ramp it up a little bit. I'm going to bring a little bit more to it and make it a little better. But that's, that's basically the way this stuff works. So, so just kind of get your head around this basic premise, right? He's saying that, that this thing, this law of cause and effect, if that thing moved, something moved it. And while he didn't know about the Big Bang and he didn't know about uh, protons and neutrons and electrons, no matter how much science we bring to the party, something has to set that stuff in motion. And when we get all the way back to the Big Bang, we need to talk about something that is kind of outside of this loop, not that does not follow the rules of the universe we live in, that does not exist because something else made it exist. Now, some folks would say, oh, well, doesn't this just go back infinitely because what created God? And what Thomas is ultimately saying is, no, no, we have to get to a point where there's something that wasn't created, that wasn't set into motion. There's something that creates itself, that exists within itself, that moves within itself. And this is this thing, whatever this thing is and whatever it looks like, this is what we call God. 
And so it's not simply about setting it aside and saying, well, that doesn't something else create God. He's saying, listen, you've got to stop thinking about that. Even if the world we know was created by a giant turtle, you know, living on Alpha Centauri, then we would still need to talk about either that turtle created itself or if something created it, then the thing that created it, we need to go back until ultimately we end up somewhere with something that creates itself. That's something that we don't have any way of understanding, that's not following the rules of this world, and that's where Thomas's argument is not as simple as it some people try to make it out to be. It's actually quite complex. Now, Thomas Aquinas doesn't stop with motion. The second argument is exactly the same, but now he's just going to take a step back and generalize, and he's going to say, look, stuff is happening. Stuff exists. That's his number one. But previously it was stuff is moving. Now he's saying, look, stuff exists at all. Number two is going to be nothing exists, nothing happens, unless something causes that thing to happen just like with motion. And so number three is going to be the exact same therefore. He's going to say, therefore, if everything has to be the effect of some cause, then we have to get all the way back to something which is itself the cause and is not an effect. It, is, it exists within itself. It's happening within itself. It does not get caused by anything. It is the first cause of everything else and it causes things without being affected by them it exists within itself and this thing we call god so number one and two very much the same argument just a little bit broader but you can see how it's easy to picture a ball moving because a foot kicked it it's a little bit more challenging in our brains to think about something existing because something else exists if I talk about me existing, I can begin to talk about how my parents existed and their parents existed and all human life existed and life itself existed and cells existed and, and amino acids existed. We can go back down that road or we can go down the other way and say I exist because there is some kind of principle that makes my cells work together and not work against one another. There is some kind of principle that causes me to be alive and in some number of months or years whenever I'm dead, that principle will change. And so I can talk about it in a very, very kind of spiritual way. I can talk about it in the sense that there are a bunch of atoms that are stuck together. And even right now, I am breathing out some of those atoms that may have been something else and now those atoms are going off to do something else and become something else. No matter what way I talk about it, though, there's always this kind of seemingly regre infinite regress that gets back to a certain point where we have to say, look, everything caused everything else until you reach a point where you say, look, so at some point there must be a stop. And we say the first thing was caused by something which could itself not be caused. Now, we want to take a moment to think this through and really kind of let's settle in here what makes this such a potent argument? Because this causal principle, this idea that everything must be caused by something else, is something we absolutely believe, right? Every bit of science is based upon this thinking. Every aspect of the world in which we live is based upon this thinking. We see somebody who is sad and we assume something has happened to make them sad. We, we you know, see the, the, the video is not working or the sound has broken as it did at my mass this morning. And immediately I look over at my computer and I say, well, something must have happened because it worked before and now it doesn't. Everything in our lives is this point of cause and effect, even down to the point of our lives having purpose, where I say, what is my life doing? What do I do today? What is my purpose? What should I effect in other people. If my life has no effect upon anything around me, I feel like I'm useless or I feel like I'm not accomplishing anything or I feel like I'm wasting my life. If I can't say at the end of my life that my causes have had effect in some way upon the world around me, then I find myself in a situation saying, well, what have I lived for at all? And so cause and effect is at the basis of what St. Thomas is trying to get to. Now the argument that, that should be bubbling up in your mind is why can't you just have an infinite regress in the world? And this is the argument that some folks have tried to make. And the answer is relatively straightforward. Again, we're operating from pure reason here. 
it's because infinity by definition does not exist in the real world. The real world is finite. It's this world and not all others. There isn't an infinite multiverse of infinite universes. This is the world which is. And because this is the world which is, there is not an infinite number of possibilities. There are not an infinite number of atoms. There are, in fact, a, a finite number of atoms. It's a big old number, but it, is, but it is not infinite. There is a certain point where if we froze time and we had some magical ability to count every atom in the universe, we would not come up with the number infinity. We'd come up with the number 8.6 to a bazillions and bazillions and bazillions, but we would have a finite number. And the same thing is true with time. There is not an infinite amount of time, and we can't go back infinitely. Because even if we try to walk back and we say, well, the Big Bang Theory could, have, could be this kind of contracting effect that's happened a hundred times, and you go, that's fine. But at a certain point, that stuff had to come into existence. And we know that because everything that exists exists because of something else. And so we can't simply say, you know, by, by sheer automagically, well, it's just easier to say it goes on infinitely because anything that's real is by its nature limited to that which is and not to that which could be. And so we're thinking from pure reason here. We're not, we're not thinking about some kind of silly, uh, you know, uh, quantum mathematical thing. We're talking about genuine logic that says finite is, means it exists in the world. Infinite is by definition. Mathematically means it does not exist in the world. Because if there was infinite anything then nothing else could exist. This is also interestingly why we can talk about God as infinite, because God himself is everything and nothing else is. I mean, just think about it. If we have a real world and there's an infinite amount of water, then everything which exists must be water. That's just, that's, that's pure reason. It's absolutely straightforward thinking, and almost all the arguments against St. Thomas end up basically trying to pretend that we can have infinity within a finite, and you can't do that. Infinity doesn't work that way. Everything that exists is by definition of the fact that it exists finite and limited. It may be big, but it's finite. So, that brings us then to number three, which is exactly this argument that I'm making. The third argument is the, called the argument uh, from the contingent and necessary objects. Now, this is a bit more philosophical, and so if it does not seem as obvious or easy to follow, don't worry. It's, it's complicated, and it's more challenging to get your head around than it, it is the argument from motion. And in this case, St. Thomas is basically saying, look, Let's say the universe exists as it does, okay? Atoms, cheese whiz, Elvis, etc. But we know it could exist in other ways. In fact, there are almost infinitely many alternate ways it could exist, almost infinitely. In one of them, Doritos don't exist. Okay, you know, it's, we could imagine a universe in which Doritos don't exist. We could imagine a universe where Miley Cyrus is a bluegrass musician and not a pop musician. You know, it's not like this is some challenging thing to do. We could imagine a universe where clowns don't exist. Uh, you know, any number of universes where big or small, things played out differently for any number of reasons. But this universe does exist. Because whoever invented Doritos invented Doritos and blah, blah, blah. And so following the same principle of causality, remember that principle of cause and effect, that following that same principle of causality, at the core of the previous two arguments, something must explain why the universe exists the way it does. 
And then something needs to explain that explanation. The guy who invented Doritos was born and he liked cheese and salt. You know, well, why did he like cheese and salt? Well, somebody turned him on to it. And then he, we, and we end up with that same kind of progression you see from motion. You know, the guy who invented Doritos, somebody caused him to like that and so on and so on and so on. We go back and we end up again, walking our way back to the Big Bang Theory. We end up again with the universe is the way it is and not some other way. And because we need to explain that going back, we have to end up with something that causes the universe to be the way it is and not another way. And we need something that doesn't fit within the rules of this universe because we're back to that uncaused cause, that unmoved mover, that one who made the universe the way it is and not the way it isn't. And again, this is a very, very compelling argument. This is not meant to be something that you just go, oh, well, whatever. We're not trying to make an argument the same way that we say 2 plus 2 equals 4 or the mixture of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid makes salt water. We're, we're, we're thinking in a way that is pure reason. We're thinking by way of pure logic. And we're trying to say, if the universe exists the way it is and, why, why, and it doesn't exist the way it doesn't, why is that? How do we make an explanation? And whatever the explanation is for any aspect of that is ultimately going to walk us back to something that caused the universe to be the way it is and did not cause it to be the way it isn't. And that argument, that, that being that exists separate from this world, fundamentally distinct from this universe, that being we call God. Again, we're not talking about God the Father. We're not talking about Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a necessary divine being that in order for the world to be the way it is, we need to posit that there must be some divine being that did this. That divine being could be a giant turtle living on Alpha Centauri, but it needs to exist. And it needs to have this characteristic of having created the universe from within itself by its own being, its own act of existence, in the way it is and not the way it isn't. So number one, two, and three all come together and they depend on this principle of causality. And these three arguments together build for us a picture of a universe that says, look, causes and effects. And so whatever this primal being is, whatever this unmoved mover, this uncaused cause is, he exists separate from creation. He does not depend upon it. And he has the capacity to create from within himself, not just a universe, but a specific universe. That's the first three points Thomas is trying to bring across. And you know what? They're very, very compelling logically. Think about it. When you know, stop the video, pause the video, think about it some more and dig into it because it's, it's a very compelling, very logically complete argument. And it's really hard to argue that it's not. Because again, you don't have to believe in the God of Christianity. You have to believe, though, that something exists out of this world. It can be any darn thing you want it to be. It can be that bunny rabbit from the life of uh, from Monty Python, if you want. It doesn't really matter what that thing looks like. It has to exist. There's no other way for it not to exist. And even if we want to try to do like some modern scientist and pretend that's a, a computer producing a hologram or whatever, no matter how we play it, we have to keep walking back until we end up with something that exists within itself. And whatever name we give to that, it is God. It may not be God of Christianity, but it must exist in the same way that the God of Christianity exists in terms of broad strokes. And so that's what Thomas has given us, and no one has ever made a compelling argument against it. It shocks me, but I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how you could. So that brings us to number four. Now, number four is going to take us in a different direction. We, we, we have the first three that have done the basic proof that God must exist. He must be thinking. He must be a creator. Now we're stepping in a different direction. And this argument four is going to talk about one of the characteristics of, of this God that must exist. And now we're talking about the argument from the degrees of perfection. This is a so-called ontological argument, and it's similar to the one St. Anselm made, uh, if you're familiar with that. Now, you might say, Father Ryan, you're a pretty good speaker. Or you might say, uh, but, you, but you know, Father so-and-so is better at this stuff. And so, you know, keep it up, but somebody else does it better. We might agree that some actor or actress is handsome or beautiful, uh, or not. We might talk about any number of attributes 
of anything, uh, and we might talk about them on a scale of perfection. I might say, my church is pretty, St. Peter's is more beautiful. I might talk about my church is, uh, is tall in terms of it being 47 feet up to the, to the, uh, the, the top, but St. Peter's is bigger. We might talk about my church um, you know, being comfortable to me, but not comfortable to someone else. We can have all these spectra, uh, these scales of things, and some of them may be utterly subjective. Some of them may be entirely objective. It's colder in this building than it is outside, and why? Because I have the air conditioner running. Um, some of these, like I said, don't really matter in the universe, but some of them are objectively true. It's hotter or it's colder. You know, that's, that's not a matter of subjective opinion. It's either hotter or colder, and we can measure that temperature difference. Beauty, you know, we can talk about about my like my I might like my church a little bit better than another church that I go say mass at, but we can all agree that St. Peter's is more impressive than my tiny little church that seats 200 people. You know, there there are going to be things that even if my subjective preference is one way or the other, there are objective realities even to things that some of us now consider to be subjective, like beauty or or wonder. So, so some things ultimately end up being better than others, and there are objective ways to measure it. Some things are more true than others. Some pots are hotter or heavier than others. So if we can think about degrees of perfection, if we can think about these various attributes, then we can only do so because in our own minds there is some baseline of perfection or totality, or completion. There's a maximum hotness. There's a maximum coldness. There's a, a beauty that we have a sense that, that this is closer to perfect beauty than that is closer to perfect beauty. We see a beautiful painting. We see something that's kind of a, a goofy watercolor that our child does, and we may have a great deal of affection for our child's wild watercolor, but we still say the Rembrandt at a deep level is just better. It's more beautiful. And we might be able to criticize all day long why that is. But this reality that we, is that we have these degrees of perfection in the world and we tend to, in our minds, have these maximums of perfection. If we can think about degrees of perfection, then we can only do so because there is a genuine perfection. Now remember, St. Thomas is, is not trying to prove the existence of God with this argument the way he is others, but he's saying, listen, well, let's, let, so he's, he's, he's okay, let me, let, me, let me back up a step because I jumped a little bit ahead of myself. So this, people get confused by this argument because St. Thomas's last point in his argument is really simple. It's, he's basically saying, if, if there is a gradation, then there is a perfection. And then he's going to tack on to the end that works with existence as well. And so if there is degrees of existence, for example, in my mind, I've got a picture right now of a purple elephant with polka dots and he's got a flower in his trunk. That's a picture in my head. It only exists in my head. You may have a similar image in your own head, but that image exists in my mind. It doesn't exist in the real world. It only exists in my mind. If I were to sketch or to paint that image, it would be more real on the canvas than it is in my mind. If somehow I were able to create a robot that was this giant purple elephant with the flower in its trunk, that would somehow be more real than the painting. And then we could say if I had the capacity somehow to create an actual living purple polka dotted elephant and give it a flower to hold, that would be more real still. So we can talk about these ideas of gradation of existence. Well, when we think about this idea as a gradation of existence, we have to put the maximum of existence as that which exists without reference to anything else. I exist because the atoms in my body are held in shape for some reason. But if those atoms went away, I would cease to exist. The maximum of existence is that which exists on its own, 
without the need for atoms or time or anything else. And that thing we call God. Now, this can be confusing because St. Thomas has already proven that there must be a being that exists outside of this universe. This argument on its own is not trying to say, you know, God must exist because I think about perfection, and if I think about perfection, then God must exist because of that. That's not what he's trying to get at. He's saying, look, I've already proven that that being must exist, and if that being exists in that way, then we have to, in our minds, be aware that all of these gradations exist as gradations of perfections that that God must have. And so if we perceive beauty and we all do, even if we try to tell ourselves we don't, we think that, you know, uh, some god-awful modern art is somehow more beautiful than St. Peter's, you know, that, that's a separate argument for, you know, po possibly an institutional experience. But we all have this sense of these things, and because, you know, we have the sense of these things, and because there are perfections, to exist is more perfect than not to exist, because this being is existence in its perfection, he must have the greatest perfections of all these other grades or gradients that we have in our minds. And so it becomes easy to dismiss that, because you can say, well, that's just stupid. If, if I think that God exists, that doesn't mean he exists. And that's why people try to throw away St. Anselm's argument, because he defines God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Basically saying this exact argument, which is itself something that flows from Aristotle again. It's not like this is a Christian invention. So we're not talking so much here about, about that God exists. Now we're starting to paint in some of the details of what that God who must exist because of arguments one, two, and three, what does he look like? What's the story? And we know that he must have the perfections of goodness and truth and beauty and unity and so on and so forth. So that's the fourth argument. So arguments one through three work to prove God must exist. He must, be, uh, he must exist in a way that is conscious and the ability to kind of make in a deliberate way. He must exist in a way that is an unmoved mover, an uncaused cause, and he must contain the, the, the maximum of the various gradients that we as our human experience judge to be good. Now, there's a lot more to say about this. This is not, you know, one paragraph. St. Thomas, remember, is going to write the entire Summa Theologica about starting off from this point and then following through with philosophy, following through with logic, following through with some science, following through with St. Paul and St. Augustine and the Bible and filling in the gaps. But this is the, the foundation and, the, and the, the base work. So, if you remember number four, we're going to get to this idea of God must be the perfection of all perfections. And then we're going to say, but when it comes to creation in a sense of, of my own mind, and I say it is better to exist than not to exist. It is better to exist more perfectly than it is to exist less. And you're thinking about my purple elephant, which exists in one mode in my mind, in a more profound way on canvas, a more profound way yet as a robot, in an even more profound way if I somehow find a way to give life to that being. And we have the idea of this kind of development. That kind of sets the stage for us to talk about number five, the fifth argument, which is the argument from intelligent design. Now let's start by saying the intelligent design that was created by uh, Protestant fundamentalists who are trying to find a way to make creationism uh, work and who are trying to reject evolution out of hand, that's not what works. There are some aspects of that that may or may not be compatible with, with Christianity or Catholicism, but that's not what we're talking about here. It's a totally different thing. It's a totally different way of thinking about things. So remember, we're thinking about my elephant. The idea and the argument of number five, the argument from Telvin Design, is simply that everything which exists, if it exists at all, then it must have some inherent uh, purpose, what we, what we could call a teleological or a final cause, using the formal words. It has some purpose built into it. It has some sense of existing for a reason because nothing exists without having any reason to exist. If I think of the purple elephant, I'm thinking of it for an example for this video. Or I'm thinking of it as something I would like to paint. I can't paint, but if I could, that I would like to paint for my entertainment. Or I'm thinking about a robot that I would create for a purpose. Or I'm thinking about a life that I would create 
for a purpose. Every single thing exists for a purpose. And then we, if, even if we move beyond the idea of me putting my purpose on it, when we look at things like atoms, atoms do what they do and exist the way they exist and work together with other atoms, that's their purpose. That's what they do. And even, even the larger system of several atoms and molecules and things like that that build out, they too follow these certain rules but the fact that the rules exist implies that there is a sense of purpose built into the universe. Now, we don't have to, again, we don't have to say that's the Christian God. We don't have to say that it's God the Father. But we do have to acknowledge that there is something in the way that the universe is constructed, the fact the laws exist at all, that creates for us a sense that everything has some sense of purpose. Everything has some sense of existing for a reason, and nothing exists without reason. Even something like the duckbill platypus, or you know, the, the species of birds that may have speciated, and now one has a different sized beak on this side of the Grand Canyon and on that side of the Grand Canyon. Everything that happens, happens for a purpose, even if that's a purpose that is not necessarily created by an author of a book. It is something that's just baked in to the fact that the thing exists at all. Philosophy students are going to recognize that St. Thomas Aquinas is ultimately going to do, create what, he's called the, what he calls the four causes, where he's going to say everything exists because it has a material cause, it has matter, atoms, and so on and so forth. It has a form cause, formal cause, which is the, the, the way in which it exists, the form or shape of the thing. I'm a human being, and that form you know, gives my atoms purpose. The atoms that are right here next to me in this pulpit, that's very different. The atoms in front of me, they're wood, and their form is wood. So I have a material cause, I have a formal cause, I have an efficient cause, something that made me the way I am, and I have a final or teleological cause that is my purpose, and nothing exists without purpose. We may lose a sense of what that purpose is. We may not be able to determine why it exists, but nothing exists without having some reason for having existed. And again, this goes back to that cause and effect. It swirls in a little bit of argument for, and now we come up with this idea, this kind of summing it all up, where we have the idea that, that, that this God which exists, exists with a sense of creative purpose. So we're not talking about intelligent design, uh, what a lot of Protestants will use, Michael Paley, and they'll talk about the idea that God is a clockmaker who makes the world, winds it up, pushes it out, and so everything is unfolding as God intends with, you know, uh, with cells and evolution and so on and so forth. That, that's not what we're thinking about at all. We're talking about the fact that everything which exists has a sense of purpose baked into it by its nature, by the very fact that it exists. And again, this is not an argument that's easy to simply throw aside. This is not an argument we say, oh, well, you know, th that doesn't matter. When you combine it with the numbers one through three that really give us a, a reality that God must exist, he must exist as someone who is an unmoved mover, an uncaused cause, the perfection of, of various uh, gra gradients of existence. And he exists because he, it can't, there can't be a universe where he doesn't exist. Then we swirl into that the idea of what he has made, this creation that we exist as a function of. There is a sense of purpose and nothing exists which doesn't have a reason to exist. Nothing is, is, a, is affected that does not have a cause. Well, again, we, we, we don't want to take our ideas of saying purpose and look and say, oh, you know, this thing has no purpose or that thing has no useful purpose or no practical purpose. We're saying everything exists as a function of some, as the effect of some cause. And so now we're in a situation where you, you can stop and ask yourself, what possible argument could you give that God doesn't exist. You can say the Christian God doesn't exist, and you could make arguments about the authenticity of the Bible. You could make arguments about supernaturality. You can make any kind of arguments you want, but if you try to get in the way of Thomas Aquinas' arguments here, 
then you have to be prepared to say, well, science doesn't exist because not every effect must have a cause. Or you have to get in the way of saying science does not exist because if the universe has infinity within it, then there's, there's no logical way to finish that sentence without saying that anything in a finite universe which is infinite is everything that is within that finite universe. It's, it's really straight, basic and straightforward. And if you try to say, oh, well, we have a multiverse, you still have the exact same question of what caused the whole thing to get going. And so we have here five really, really compelling arguments for the existence of God without ever quoting the Bible, without ever really having to look beyond what is basic pure reason and the simple experience that something moves, something exists, the universe exists this way and not that way. I understand that certain things exist in different ways using the same characteristics, hotter or colder. And then ultimately, I can make the conclusion that nothing exists which was not made for the purpose of existing as it is. And once we get to that point, we're left with saying, therefore, there must exist a divine being who is an unmoved mover, an uncaused cause, who made the universe this way and not that way, who is himself the perfection of existence and therefore must be the perfection of other perfections or other gradients. And then finally, he made the universe in such a way that everything exists with a sense of purpose built into it and nothing exists which does not have a sense of purpose built into it. And so that's where we come from in Christian philosophy to understand how it is that God exists, philosophically speaking. This is a philosophical argument. If you've never done real philosophy before, this is what it looks like. You know, we're, we're trying to make reasonable conclusions based upon logic and reason and not trying to get ourselves distracted by, by science or things like that. We're, we're focused on what, do, what are the consequences of ideas because all ideas have consequences. And so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope it's been helpful for you. Uh, if you have uh, comments, please feel free to jump in. If you feel like you're finally the person who's going to be able to upset St. Thomas Aquinas and prove one or more of these wrong, then I certainly encourage you to, to do so. Uh, you're going to need to do a lot of research. You're going to have to be really, really smart. But hey, go for it. Think it through. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions, as I said, on social media. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. God bless, and we'll see you later on.